Bienvenidos a Pensadores Contemporáneos. Es un gusto estar aquí con, con usted. Este, tenemos un invitado de, de lujo, como siempre, en esta serie. Este, Professor uh, Graham Murdoch, welcome to the UNAM. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to have you here in this, this wonderful space, the, the Museo este, de Arte Contemporáneo, the Contemporary Art Museum of the, of the UNAM. Um, let me uh, tell the, the audience who you are first. Um, uh, Graham Murdoch is professor at the Institute for Media and Creative Industries at Loughborough University in England. Um, he's uh, one of the great experts on uh, media and communications in, in the world. He is professor of culture and economy and has a particular interest in advertising and broadcasting industries, risk communication, and also uh, the Asian uh, media as well. You spent time in, in China. Uh, he is also vice president of the International Association of Media and Communications Research. Um, these are very important topics for us here in, in Mexico, and it's a real uh, pleasure and honor to have you here. Well, it's, it's, it's my pleasure and a great honor to be here. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, there's lots of uh, uh, hype, I uh -huh. would say, about the Internet uh -huh. these days, right? People say that the Internet uh, liberates us, um, is somehow going to create uh, a free space uh, for humanity to uh, reach another step of, of knowledge and, and truth. Uh, are these expectations exaggerated or is this going to, to happen uh, in the contemporary world? Well, the, the, the Internet's the, 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 the site of an intense struggle. You know, when, when it was first uh, muted, uh, one of the pioneers was, a, was an English guy, uh, Tim Berners-Lee. He mm -hmm. was working in the high energy physics laboratory and he wanted to find a way to connect all the scientists together, even those who didn't have any expertise in computer programming. So out of that came the notion of the World Wide Web, which mm -hmm. was a, a, a network that anyone could use. You didn't need to know anything about computers. You just logged on, and there you, there you go. And his idea was this would be a, a, a flat system, a horizontal system. Everybody would be equally. Uh, powerful. They'd be able to participate, they'd be able to uh, initiate as well as to receive. And the idea originally was that that would break the power of the big media companies. Mm -hmm. Remember, this is a time when you see a great consolidation in the Hollywood studios, the newspaper industry. So you had a, a few companies that were really dominating mm -hmm. uh, the, the top-down flow of communication. So the internet was seen as a way to break that, mm -hmm. a way, way to break it up, to get everybody a chance to speak. What's happened, of course, is exactly the opposite of that. And, and this is something nobody really understood at the time, including me, that it's happened very quickly. So you've got companies like Google and Facebook, mm -hmm. and they invented a brilliant business model where people participate, but in return, they give away all of the information about themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That information then becomes the basis for targeting advertising mm -hmm. and increasingly now political messages. Mm -hmm. So basically, we, we have a, a, a top-down system. It, it's Google and, and Facebook and, and uh, Amazon uh, and Apple who determine the way these technologies will be used. So we have a struggle. I, I, one of those people who argue we actually need a we need to go back to the idea of a public internet mm -hmm. not not an internet that's dominated by selling advertising and not an internet that takes your data and uses it in ways you have no knowledge of for things that you probably would not approve of so at the moment we we, we have a real conflict on on, on, on on about the future of those technologies mm -hmm. the potential that tim berners lee imagined is still there mm -hmm. And he's recently written about that, and he's very disappointed. He's very upset by what has happened. But the potential is still there, but we need to do something different now. There's also this other story about the Internet, that somehow it was invented by the, the U.S. military, right? Well, the, the technology um, was. The technology the, so, was. So you yes. have that other side to it from the very beginning as well, right? That, that's right. And, uh, and, 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 and you know, yeah. I, I, recently I saw this, the, the, the Snowden movie, right? Yes, which, yes. Which yeah. kind of projects very clearly how the Internet is in some ways about control as well, right? It, it was always that potential, but the, the, the Berners-Lee version of it was about openness and democracy and, and bringing people together, uh, uh, trying to, to create a space where people could 
uh, talk together and, and, and try to puzzle out how to handle the big problems of our time was a very utopian view in lots of ways, but a very, a very honorable view. Um, and for a brief period, it worked like that. There were lots of experiments, and there still are. There still are parts of the internet that work like that. But if you look at what most people do most of the time, it's dominated by those big companies. Right, I mean, I use Google. I don't, of do, course. You, do you use Google? Or of no course, and, right. and, and you know, I'm sure you have a Facebook page. Yes? Of course, Facebook, yeah. Twitter, so, yeah. Well, we, we, that's the problem. We, we, we have to separate the, the, the social value that we get from those things from the way that they're organized. So yes, it's wonderful to have that facility to communicate with people across the world on Facebook, to exchange ideas. Uh, but unfortunately, it's Facebook. What, what we really need to work towards is a way of, of having those connections in a, in a non-commercialized, non-exploitative way. Right, because Facebook and Twitter, people, I, it's obvious, but people don't realize that these are, you know, private companies who can shut you down. Of course. Uh, and, and they're doing this now, of course, with all this hysteria in the United States uh, or in other countries in the world of, you know, Russian intervention or foreign intervention. They're starting to cut down and, and use that as an excuse to um, uh, uh, reduce uh, uh, freedom of speech uh, or... Uh, I mean, can we imagine a, a real public platform? Is anybody actually doing this? Well, I think people are, people are beginning to think about it now because uh, I think cri uh, what the, the, the Trump election and the Brexit, the, the Brexit vote in Britain have really uh, brought home to people how easy it is to manipulate the, the, these online platforms and how sinister some of the people are who are doing that. Uh, I mean, some of the racist, uh, xenophobic material that's on, 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 on Facebook every day and on, 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 on YouTube, it, it's impossible to control. You know, remember, back, back, back when the US passed the law, they passed a, a decency law, which I'm sure you remember. What, what, what happened was that the, the, the internet guys said, we're not publishers, we're just platforms. We're like the telephone company. In the right. same way, we won't censor what people say on the telephone. It's not our job to do that. We're just a, a conduit. And so they, 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 they refused to take any responsibility until very recently for what appears. They say, well, that's the responsibility of the people who post it. The problem with that is if, if you look at like traditional journalism, we, we, we had, we, we developed very elaborate ways of deciding what is acceptable and what is not, not just legally but also morally and, and in terms of public value. The problem with Google and Facebook is they don't have that mentality. They don't, that's not how they decide what will, what will be allowed and what will not be allowed. Uh, so again, if we, if we wanted to have a, an alternative, we would have to go back to some form of editorial mm -hmm. procedure, mm -hmm. but an open procedure, a procedure that operates with transparent rules. Uh, one of the big problems with Facebook and Google is their secrecy. I mean, a lot of what appears is, is determined by algorithms, you know, computer pieces of code, which are secret. We don't know what the basis of those decisions is. It's not like an editor. Uh, you know, at least with an editor, you could challenge them and say, you know, uh, I, I object to what you've done. You can't do that with an algorithm. Uh, there's nobody there. Um, so what you're saying is that we shouldn't, if it's the correct word to use, fetishize the internet, right? Well, the we internet. Need to see the, it in, uh, let me, if you, if you, we have time. This is a good long program, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna read a, okay. a sentence from your handbook of political economy and okay. communications. Rather than starting with the technology and asking what it, what is its likely impact, critical analysis starts from the prevailing distribution of power and inequality and asks whose interests will be best served by these new potentialities. From this perspective, digital media appear not as a primary lever of change, but as a new field of struggle dominated by long-standing battles and combatants. The sites and terms of engagement may shift, but the stakes remain the same, right? This is from the introduction to the handbook. Uh, that's, the I, I, I have no objection to that. That's a, that's a, good, good, a good sentence from your own, from your own yes. writing. But, uh, so in and of itself, the internet's not going to liberate us. It's just another um, sphere of dispute for power. It's the same with all technologies, uh -huh. isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you think of the, 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 the original automobile. The, one, of the, one, one of the ideas was that they should be electric. This is mm -hmm. way back in the beginning of the automobile. 
Well, because of the power of the oil companies, exactly. we, 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 we organize them around the internal combustion engine with the tragic kind of pollution that we now have. But that wasn't because the technology couldn't have been used in a different way. And now we're reinventing the idea of the electric car. You know, it's over 100 years old. It took us 100 years to realize that the internal combustion engine wasn't the best way to organize this mm -hmm, system. Mm -hmm. So technology is always a site of struggle and always a site of choices. And those, it's a question of who makes those choices and who can enforce their choice on everybody else. Uh, so it is a question of power, obviously. And you think you have hope still that the state will be able to regulate and intervene in this sphere to create a a more public interest nature of the internet, or do you think it's something we have to do in a more decentralized way? I think both. I mean, I, I think we, we have no other mechanism than states for in, enforcing law, for example. Uh, you can't decentralize law. Uh, you have to have one law uh, uh, that fits everybody, and it has to be enforced. But I think some of the most interesting things that are happening are happening at a micro level. Uh, so there, the, I, I, I've been one of those economists who've wanted to revive the idea of gift economies. Mm -hmm. so if, you, if, you, if you look at the map of the way we think about modern economies, we think about it as a, as a kind of a contest between the state on the one hand, as both a regulator but also an investor, and markets. Um, but there's always been a third economy, which is the economy of gifts. Uh, people get together and do things without asking for payment, mm -hmm. uh, and they create things together that everybody can benefit from. And a, a lot of what goes on in everyday life is like that. Uh, it's sharing, it's cooperative, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's egalitarian. So we need to retrieve that way of working at a local level, but we need to protect it with a legal framework which is enforceable at a higher level. Uh, so for me, the challenge is putting together those two non-commercialized economies, uh, the, the economy of public goods, where as taxpayers, we invest in things we all use, public parks, public libraries, public education. Even if we don't ourselves benefit directly, we believe that a civilized society is better for having those kinds of facilities that everybody shares. But there's also this economy of gifts, this economy of reciprocity. So for me, the, what we need to think about is how to put those two things together. So it's not a question of reimposing a sort of centralized control. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a question of creating a protective umbrella, if you like, underneath which other things can happen. Uh, and of course, there are many things that happen on the internet, which are exactly those gift economies. Wikipedia would be the most classic example. Mm -hmm. Biggest encyclopedia in the history of the world, entirely created by donation, voluntary activity. Okay, it's not perfect, but what a magnificent idea. Uh, that's a classic example of a gift economy. Um, it's funny, because you talk about the gift economy, and then another part of your research is about all of the costs which are behind the internet, right? Of course, yes. Because in, it's funny, you can never get away from, um, uh, from resources, real resources. No, it's, absolutely. It's, and that's another fascinating part about your research, is that you talk about the, you know, the media and the internet and the gift economy, but also how this is, uh, actually has created an explosion of the creation and the use of machines yes. and energy. Yes. Um, uh, the other day, my, my daughter uh, came back home uh, totally freaked out because her teacher had told her about this. You know, she, he said to her, you know, every time you turn on your cell phone, every time you send a WhatsApp message, you're using energy and you're polluting the world. And all of a sudden, she didn't want to use her cell phone anymore. It was actually quite miraculous because we live in this um, uh, dream world in which you know the WhatsApp messages and the internet is is somehow free, but actually has all these incredible costs. Yeah. Um, what have you What have you discovered in, in, well, in I, that I, realm? Well, I've been trying to put uh, along, along with a, a number of other people. It's, it's what you might call the backstory of the exactly. internet. Yes. And it's been forgotten because um, all the attention, if you think of the mobile phone, all the attention is arguing about what appears on the screen, who mm -hmm. controls it, mm -hmm. uh, which should be censored, uh, should we have advertising for children. These are important issues. Th these are not insignificant issues. But there's something, be there's something behind all of that, which is the machine itself, as you say. Uh, and 
now we have a world where the predictions are that there'll be an enormous increase in the number of cell phones in, in, in poorer countries, in India, in China, sub-Saharan Africa. But not only that, we're, we're in the business of inventing a whole lot of other new machines, like the personal assistant, Siri, and so on, mm -hmm. uh, the Internet of Things, intelligent washing machine, and so on. We're, we're, we're multiplying the number of machines and devices. And that creates a problem, because if you have to ask, OK, what are they made of? What, where do these minerals come from? And under what circumstances are they mined? Is, does it involve child labor? Should we be complicit in that? Uh, what happens to it when it's assembled in the Foxconn factory and they have nets outside the factory to stop people jumping off the roof for suicides because they're so depressed with the conditions they're working in? The workers themselves. They, yes, they, the workers they, themselves. Where so, is this? Yeah, they have uh, suicide mm -hmm. nets uh, uh, around well, in the what, In what country? Is it? This is Foxconn, which is a Taiwanese company, Taiwan. which mm -hmm. is the main uh, main assembler f of, of a lot of the tablets and, and, and cell phones we use. Uh, then, you, then you say, OK, how do they get to you? They come on container ships, which are a massive contributor to polluting the ocean. And then when you get them, what are they about? They're about advertising. So we, we've seen a ma the, the, the internet is, 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 is environmentally problematic for two reasons. First of all, it's now the main site of hyper advertising to encourage you to, to buy things almost every day, including things you don't need. And, and uh, in if, particular, things you don't need. But, right? but, <laughs> but, but the cell phone itself, we're, we're encouraged to replace you know, the cell phone almost every year and throw the others away. You know, this is unsustainable. It's creating incredible amounts of waste. And then we ask the question, OK, what, what is this thing made of? And what are the social environmental costs of bringing it to you? And I think given, as you know, last Monday, you, you had the latest uh, uh, report from the, 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 the Environmental uh, Committee, which says we have 15 years left before we're really in even deeper trouble than we are now. That the, is, on a global uh, scale. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, 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 world is, the world is already warmed one degree warmer than the beginning of the industrial period. If it goes over 1.5, chaos ensues, uh, I mean, of a serious nature. And everywhere in the world this summer, you've seen these extreme weather events. This is not something way in the future. This is something that's accelerating now. So we have to think about, if we're going to be critical about communications, we have to be critical all the way through. Right. Yeah? Mm -hmm. It's not only just about what appears and who controls that. It's about the very f material basis of our communication. So we have to ask, OK, are there other materials we could, use, we could use? How do we generate the energy? What's the least environmental damaging way to, to generate the energy we need to keep these machines running? And these are questions that communication scholars have not usually asked because they, they, they belong to engineers and they belong to physicists. I think, I, I, I argue very strongly, they're our responsibility as well. Of course, of course. That's, uh, the, that's the, 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 the political economy approach that, yes, you're, that uh, you, uh, you defend yeah. and, and exercise. Yeah, no. Is, are there efforts to create recyclable cell phones? Yes, there, yeah. Well, there, there are lots of. Uh, I mean, one of the one of the I thought one of the, the, the most brilliant inventions was 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 the clock the, the, the clockwork radio. Okay, mm -hmm. you know you 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 have poor poor, poor people in sub-Saharan Africa. There's no way they're ever going to have a reliable electricity system in the way we understand it. So how are they going to have radio? So they said, okay, we'll have clockwork radio. Wind up wind up radio. We'll wake the radios out of very resilient cardboard. We're now building cathedrals out of cardboard. You don't have to have metal. So there's a lot, of, what's exciting actually, if you look at material science and energy science, there's a lot of very interesting experiments going on with alternative substances, alternative ways of generating. And I think we ought to be part of that debate and say, well, you know, maybe we want to clockwork, uh, uh, clockwork cell phone or whatever. Cardboard you know. wind up, um, um, you know, iPads, right? Well, I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I, I grew up in a childhood where, you know, everything was wound up. I mean, we uh -huh. had clockwork toys and they of worked course. perfectly well. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that, that's just an example. I mean, the, the, the new materials technologies are more sophisticated, but they're, they're on the horizon. It's not that they don't exist. So again, the question is, are we going to invest in them? Are we going to prioritize them? Uh, and um, are, are we going to really take that seriously?
Yeah. And, the, and the working conditions for, you mentioned this one particular case, yes. uh, uh, Taiwanese uh, uh, corporation. Yeah, they're, they're in, in general, um, there are worse working conditions for, for those who, who construct technology than cars, for instance? Well, you, what you see in the labor market generally is a, is a, is a very sharp division uh, between the, the, the very privileged and the, 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 the casualized uh, exploited. And you, you see it at every level. Uh, you see it in Google. I mean, you, you have this, this um, uh, elite group of programmers and designers. They, they live wonderfully well. But a lot of what goes on is casualized. It's farmed out to people who have no security of tenure. Uh, they have no welfare rights. They have to pay for their own uh, health care and so on. So we, we've, we've, we've ripped out a lot of the protections for workers. And the other thing that happened, one of the features of globalization was outsourcing. That, that we, we, we took all the dirty jobs out of our economies and dumped them in faraway places where people didn't see them. So a lot of the routine assembly work is done in, in what were low-income economies uh, like China. Um, and under very exploitative uh, conditions. I mean, the, 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 the migration in China over the last 20 years is the largest migration in human history by a huge margin. And it's mostly poor peasants coming into the cities to look for work. Uh, and, and a lot of those are young women. If you're not going to work in construction, you're going to work in these very, very uh, almost sweatshop conditions, assembling cheap, uh, cheap trousers and, 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 and iPhones and so on. And they live in barrack-like you know, conditions, almost militarized conditions. And it's very depressing. And so you have, a, you have a, a number of attempted suicides, which is why you have those nets at the top of the factory, so you can't kill yourself, because it's not very good publicity. Uh, of course. No, that's very, very important. You, you spent a lot of time in China yes, yourself. Yeah. Uh, how long have you been going to Well, I, I go every year. And, uh -huh. and, and, you know, I, I probably spend about two months a year. So You teach classes, or what, what are, you, are you doing research there particularly? Yeah, well, no, I, 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 um, I, I, I teach in, in Fudan University in the School of Journalism, and I, I travel around a lot as well. And I now know a lot of people there, and um, they, they will tell you stories, uh, you know, if they trust you. And, and it's... What, what happened, I mean, China's so complicated. I mean, you have to understand the Cultural Revolution was an absolute disaster. It, it devastated everybody's life. Uh, and so when, when Deng Xiaoping comes, and he himself was a, a victim of the Cultural Revolution. So he had that, that sort of moral authority. He, he'd been on the sharp end. And he brings in the so-called reforms, which are to, to lighten up the, 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 the economy, bring in more market reforms, uh, uh, and, but also to be a little bit more outward looking, not to be, you know, a hermit kingdom and, and to, you know, re-enter the, 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 the global system. Um, and for many people, that, that was an incredible liberation of, after what had happened. But now there's a problem because all of the, the welfare system has been stripped out. So, you know, in the old days, if you were a worker, you belonged to something called a work unit. And that gave you welfare for life. You gave you subsidized Come housing, system, yeah. you know, <laughs> nursery school for your kids and so on. That's all gone. And, and that now you have to pay for everything. And now people are beginning to understand the downside of having stripped out that, <laughs> Capitalism, that, that, right? that, that welfare system, right? Um, and, and so uh, they're beginning to confront that now. And then, of course, you, you add in the one-child policy and the so-called, you know, little princes, little emperors. So some of these kids, uh, you know, they're, they're, there's a kind of institutionalized selfishness in the culture because they've never had to share anything, even with brothers and sisters. Right. Um, and a lot of them were in the business of retrieving the honor of the family after the devastation of, of the Cultural Revolution. So they felt an incredible pressure to succeed, you know, to, to do something to restore the family. Uh, so that generation is, 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 is right now rising into positions of power. And there's a kind of individualism there. It's almost a new cultural revolution, but this time neoliberal yes, capitalist. Instead of absolutely. Instead of and, 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 uh, you know, but, I mean, the, the, the Chinese are uber consumers. You find more malls in China than you would find anywhere in the world. In fact, of Well, the, maybe not Mexico City. We've, we've, uh, you, they've been having a, 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 yeah. a massive construction <laughs> in the last just four or five years. Uh, but, but China, in terms of technology, is an interesting case. I, I don't know too much well, about it, but it seems to me that 
you know, they, they do serious efforts of, you know, um, tropicalizing or nationalizing um, technology, right? Yes. They don't allow these international corporations just to come in and, and exploit, but they actually require them to leave um, some of their technology in oh, China. Yeah, yeah. And there's a real, you know, commitment to national um, development and adaptation uh, of technologies. Uh, or or uh, am I uh, making that up? No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, well, you, you know, the, the first phase of, uh, of, 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 of the kind of reform period was was dedicated to, to building a, a, the infrastructure. So, you you know, you have the bullet trains and you have a mag magnificent bridges and highways and, and a huge construction. Well, that, that's that's sort of coming to an end, and, and the, the next phase is, is to is to be the dominant force in the new digital technologies, artificial intelligence. Uh, that's where they see themselves moving. So, if, you, and if it's you, state investment, uh, uh, well, the state sponsors it. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. mean, this is this is a state-driven program for putting China back on top. Uh, so it no longer wants to be the assembly plant of the world. It wants to be uh, the owner of the key intellectual property that will dominate the, the new technology. We're talking robots, artificial intelligence, and, and, and all of that. And, and they, they're filing more patents than the United States, even now. Um, so and is that an encouraging development in terms of, you know, um, uh, multilateral uh, um, uh, plurality in terms of who controls technology, or is this a concern well, that the Chinese are somehow again, getting well, ahead? Basically, you've got two two huge concentrations of power. I mean, it, 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 we, you know, we think about Google and Facebook and Amazon. In, in, in China, you have Tencent, uh, Baidu, and and um, uh, um, the others. And, and, and so you have, the, you, you have the same kind of incredible concentration of control over key technologies. Uh, and what, what classically happens in both societies is that startups get, you know, eaten up. Eaten they, up they, they, they just, you know, they come with a bright idea, it looks like it will fly, immediately they get bought up, you know. Uh, so you, 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 we're actually moving towards an even more concentrated system than we've seen before. And, and the, the thing about those technologies is that they have more than one application. So they're, they're, you know, something like artificial intelligence isn't a special technology. It's, it's something that has applications across the board. So who controls the intellectual property for that is incredibly powerful. Uh, Right. So, but how about a country like Mexico, where we are yeah. today, or, or you know, middle-income countries? Yeah. Uh, well, what's our option? Is it is this to choose between the right, or to choose between the Chinese and the Americans, or is there some possibility of creating you know more domestic, uh, you know, a third way from the south? Uh -huh. um, uh, do you have any optimism in that? Yeah, or, I think or, that's a really interesting question, and I mean the the. The, the key is in, in intellectual property, isn't it? Uh, I mean, and, and that, that's where that's where you know societies like Mexico and Britain have been very weak because they, they, they have a lot of ingenuity, they have a lot of imagination, but they don't own the the the, the rights that you 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 you're, you're, you're piggybacking on on a on a, on a, a technology that's been originated and is controlled somewhere else for which you have to pay, and, and that's that that I think is is. A real problem that the, the I, I'm sure that 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 that, that you will find and, 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 and English people will find very creative ways to use the, these technologies, but they won't own the technology and they won't be able to determine the direction in which the technology goes. And the the plug could be pulled at any minute. That's that's absolutely. the, that's the most scary thing yeah, about yeah, it. Exactly. That, you know? I mean, yeah, absolutely. Because you don't own you don't own the the, the, the patent. You don't own you know. The, and if you look at the history of media, you think of you know those huge patent wars. Edison, all of these guys were involved for years over struggles about who owned the patent for you know everything. Uh, Let's, uh, we're getting really into political economy. Let's get back to media yeah, as okay. such, right? So is television as such going to disappear? No, no, of course not. I mean, it, it, it's, it's stronger than it's ever been. It depends what you mean by television. If you mean the little box in the corner that uh, the family <laughs> gather around and watch every evening, yeah, that, that's getting less and less. But if you, if you think of, of, of television as a, as, a, as a form of expression, people are watching it on all kinds of devices now. Right. So they're probably watching more television than they've ever watched in their life. Mm -hmm. They watch it on the bus, they watch it, you know, everywhere. Uh, so, you know, it, it's not that television as a, as a cultural uh, form is disappearing. I think it's stronger than ever. I think the, the idea that, that, that you, there was only one 
point of access to it, and that was this little box. That's gone. Right, that's a good way of putting it. And, and perhaps the same goes for reading, right? I mean, the book as a, as a you know, a, as we know it, um, is perhaps uh, not as common in the living rooms of uh, human beings, but the act of reading um, is perhaps even more common today because you, you're always reading on the internet, or, or, or no? Well, I think, I think that's, that, that's true, but I, I, I wouldn't give up on the book too soon. Uh, last year in Britain, physical books outsold e-books for the first time for a long time. And I think there's a drift back. E-books had, had, had gotten ahead. They, they, they were ahead for a time, uh -huh. you know. And well, now it's coming back. And now okay. it's coming back. And I think the reason is that there's something about the materiality of the book. It's like, it's, you know, if you go into a record store now, okay, streaming is very big, but vinyl has come back. Right. Yes, people are buying vinyl records. Uh, that nobody believed that would happen. You know, there's something about the the, the physical handling of the uh, having that, that that relationship to it, which you don't get with digital media. And, and, and books. I mean, I, uh, my father was a printer, so mm -hmm. I, I grew up with looking at typefaces, uh, looking at the covers, the beautiful designs on the covers of books, yes? There, there were some of the great works of art of the 20th century have been record sleeves and, and, and cover designs for books. And, and you cherish them, you know, they give you pleasure just, just seeing them again. Uh, you don't get that if you download it. So I think people are beginning to see, yeah, actually this is a nice object to have, you know? Uh, it, it's, 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 it's not something I want to give up too easily. Um, so I, I don't know. Uh, we're in a very we're in a very fast moving situation, but there's been a tendency to believe every new medium will wipe out old media. But look at what's happened to radio. Radio is more more more, more important now than it's ever been. You know, is that, radio is, that the case? is a real uh, boom industry. Uh, more people listen to radio today than. Uh, well, well, again, they listen, uh, but uh, you know, it's not radio. It's not only radio as we know it. It's also podcasts. Yes, of course. People are listening to all kinds of things. Uh, so the radio industry yeah, is 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 very vibrant at the moment. Uh, but the, the 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 distribution forms are changing. But it's still, I think, podcasts are still radio. I mean, you know. Uh, but is there beyond particular medium? It, it, do you detect a transformation in human consciousness well, that, uh, in, in the way of, of communicating? I mean, are, are, we, are we communicating and understanding the world qualitatively in a qualitatively different way than we did 50 or 100 years ago or, well, or not? I, I think that, that's, the, that, that's, the, uh, that's, the, that's the classic thing. I mean, over what time period are you going to make that assumption? I mean, when writing came in, there was a big, big argument. They said, oh, this is bad because people won't need to remember anything anymore. <laughs> right, you know, it will destroy memory <laughs> because, you know, why would you, you know, you had the oral tradition where people had to mm -hmm. remember things. And, you know, if you could write it down, well, you don't need to remember. Well, memory doesn't, hasn't disappeared, has it? It's been <laughs> so I think we have Good to be point. a little bit careful. I mean, my, my view has always been that nothing ever goes away. Uh -huh. So what, what, what happens is that one thing is on top of the other. Uh, and it, it's like a recomposition. It's like a geological, geological strata. But you, you know, you find the most ancient forms of communication still coexisting. And at certain moments in time, they they come back. You know, they they, they have a, a moment where they're rediscovered. Uh, or you know, speech has not disappeared. Uh, writing has not disappeared. Uh, uh, photography. Photography is very interesting. We're, we're now going back to. People want to have the old style, the reinventing roll film photography, because there's something about the quality of the image that is different from a digital digital image. So lots of artists are now very interested in going back to those old techniques uh, because it gives a quality of image which you can't reproduce digitally. Uh, now, that there are also wonderful things you can do with digital technology, like virtual reality and so on, which you can't do with old technologies. But I don't think that will cancel the old technologies. They will find a new niche, maybe in fine art, yes? They won't be a, a kind of popular activity, but they'll be in fine art. Uh, uh, so they will never disappear. Uh, so I, I'm... So you're optimistic in the end? 
I, I, about well, the, I'm, the, I'm optimistic the about that. Of, I mean, I, 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 whether it's going to change consciousness is is actually a really big question, and uh, some psychologists have been wrestling with that. But I, I think it's way too early to tell about a fundamental shift. What I do think is changing is 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 the nature of social relationships and the way we think about time. That uh, I, I think we're now working on much smaller units of time in, every, spans, in, right? in everyday life we're used to. For example, when I was a kid, you, you, would, you would say, uh, let, why don't we play football on Friday in the park? Mm -hmm. People would say, yeah, let, we'll do that. And you'd, you'd go through the whole week, you wouldn't worry. You knew, you went go down to the park, and there they all were. <laughs> and you, you, know, you, you didn't worry. You. I, 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 I've been working with kids recently who worry half an hour after they've sent a text that they don't get a reply. Exactly. Or, you know, they think, oh, they don't love me anymore. Or they're planning something and they're not including me. So, you know, that, that's something mm -hmm. new. That, that, that paranoia is something that's different. Um, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and everything is now compressed. And attention spans, just, you know, uh, uh, in order for something to really viralize in terms yeah. of, you can use that, if that's so a, we, a correct verb, <laughs> you need to have a, uh, a video, your video shouldn't be more than two minutes. It's, 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 it's well, the yes. standard practice, right? Well, except that, you know, people said that about children, but look at Harry Potter. I mean, you're, you're looking at, you know, huge books with like 600 pages. You know, kids were absolutely obsessed with them. So I, you know, that, that, that's the other side. I, I, I don't think it's all in, all in one direction uh, at all. Um, and I, 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 I think it's a, it's a much more, much more of a kind of a conflict and a, a tension maybe between different things. Let's go to uh, more personal questions. You said your, your father was a He's printer. A, a printer, yeah. Is, is that how you explain your interest today in, in media or did that come in for some other well, reason? Well, I think, uh, I think I, it, it's partly that because um, uh, he, 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 he ended his life uh, printing fine arts. So I, I, uh, as children, we, we got very familiar with, with having images in the house. So I, I was very interested in the way images worked. Uh, but uh, I, I think actually the, the main influence was my grandfather. My, my grandfather was also a printer. <coughs> and when he died, we inherited his library. He printed books, um, but all kinds of books. Um, so we, I, I couldn't say I grew up in a house without books. We had lots of books. Mm -hmm. But they were arranged on the shelf in the order in which he'd printed them, right? So when I was a kid, it didn't make, that made perfect sense to me. Uh, so when I went to, to the library for the first time, I couldn't understand why the books were in separate places. <laughs> By categories. Yeah, in right? categories. And I think that, that actually has been fundamental to the way I think. I don't think in categories. I, I don't. I don't put put that over there and that over there. So a lot of my work has been about trying More to bring historic, bring uh -huh. things together. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so I, I, I've never really under. I don't think in the Dewey Decimal System. Uh, I, I think about a problem, and then I think, okay, what do we need to get a handle on this, and where would I find it? And it could be anywhere in the library. Uh, it usually is, uh, and that's one of the reasons I think universities are a problem because we've invented something we call disciplines. You think about the right, word well, not the universities, but the right. The, well, you know, the, we the, think about the, the way word. in which our universities are organized yeah, so today. We have, yeah. You know, we, we have the Department of Sociology over there, the Department of Politics. You're a sociologist. By training, you're a sociologist. Yeah, right? you know, but, you know, we've separated all those things out. And, and very often, you know, students are now forced to specialize. You know, they, 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 they identify themselves as scholars of that. Um, and I think that's a problem because the more, the more I look at the big problems, the more I realize you have to actually draw on all of those resources and find a way of putting them together. And also not, not, not just humanities and social science, but also physical sciences. Uh, so we need a much more uh, open intellectual arena than we've got at the moment. Interdisciplinary. Yeah, I, I've always that that's always I've always worked in interdisciplinary systems. I've never wanted to work in a department that only did one thing. That's a it's a, it's a real challenge because yeah we have this university structure of in course. the world which is inherent in the nineteenth century really you know or well of course because uh, you know it, it's a fight for resources so you know mm -hmm. if you're the philosophy department you make a claim about the importance of what you do and that means uh, you know the economics department gets one less 
less post than they might have done. So, I mean, th there's a real material basis to those conflicts. It's not just a, a conflict of ideas, it's a conflict of resources. But it has, I, I think, unfortunate consequences because it, it means people, uh, universities are like uh, feudal, like feudal, uh, feudal Europe, you know, you, you, you have these little, little, little principalities called, you know, the Department of X and the Department of Y, and, and they basically see each other as uh, antagonists uh, competing for resources. But I think the scale of what we're now facing and the complexity of what we're now facing requires us to be a little bit more open to other people than we, we have been. And do you consider yourself a Marxist? Ah, well, you haven't mentioned him yet, but there's some. No, there's I'm, some I'm just finishing a book on Marx. Yes. Uh -huh. I, 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 my, my position has always been that he, he's one of the fundamental thinkers. He's one of the thinkers you cannot go past. You have to go. You have to confront him. It's like Freud. You know, you have to decide what you think. And he, he had. To, he was a brilliant man, but he made a lot of errors. Because he was a man of his time. You know, he's Victorian, um, and he was very high bourgeois. And there's a very famous, well, not just... High bourgeois in, in what sense? Well, we, we, you know, he came, came from a very highly educated uh, professional family. His, his, his uncles were rabbis, his father was a lawyer. So, you know, he, he was trained in classical Greek and Roman. I mean, he, you know, that wasn't the normal education of the German of <laughs> working mm -hmm. class. And there's a, there's a story about Marx where he was at dinner once and um, a, 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 a woman said to him, she said, she said, Herr Marx, I don't think you would be very happy in the society you've been sketching out for us. And he said, no, no nor do I. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, there wouldn't be conflict, right? It would be, you know. Right. <laughs> well, he was a little bit of an elitist in uh -huh. a lot of ways. But he had brilliant ideas. And one of the things that he understood, which a lot of people didn't, was that capitalism is endemically crisis prone. Of course. A lot of people just saw it as a smooth path. Mm -hmm. Marx said no, that, that this, is a, this is an engine that has a major fault mm -hmm. and it's going to run into the ground. And he was right. And, and what's very interesting is after the financial crash of 2008, even uh, the economists said, we have a lot to learn from Marx. Of course. And, and that's about a revival of, of, of I mean, Marx, and Marxism. And also you have to separate Marx from what happened afterwards. Uh, you know, he's not responsible for Stalin in the same way that Christ isn't responsible for Peter Far Priests. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, it's, <laughs> you know, uh, Marx, Marx would have been very appalled by what happened in the Soviet Union because he wasn't, he wasn't a centralizer. He was, he was actually, communism for him was about the commons. It was about communality. It was about ways of giving back, back people their dignity in, in, a, in a system where there was a set of social bonds of respect and, and reciprocity. That's what he, it was a very moral position that he had. Uh, his problem was, of course, that he, he wasn't very clear about how you, how you brought that about. He actually wrote very little about the future. He said, well, I've got enough to do trying to understand capitalism now. So that, that's the big problem. There, there, there's a kind of almost like an empty space in Marx about the future society. So who would be your most important intellectual inspir inspiration, you know, the classic author um, who, well, well, who, you would, uh, who you would use in, as your first reading in your classes? Or, uh, well, that's difficult. I, that's, that's very difficult. Uh, um, um, I, of, of, modern, of modern authors, I, I'm an enormous fan of Pierre Bourdieu. Bourdieu. Mm -hmm. uh, for two reasons. Well, one, one, I think he was a very fertile uh, thinker. But also, he, uh, unusually among French thinkers, he got out and got his hands dirty. Mm -hmm. He did a lot of research work. Uh, in, in all kinds of different styles, survey research, anthropological research, and so on. And I admire that because uh, I, 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 I was lucky in my education because I, 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 I went up to university at a time when there were two traditions. There, there was, the British tradition is very pragmatic. It's very focused on evidence which is a good thing, but it misses the big picture. And a lot of the people who taught me were that generation of emigres who'd, who'd had to leave Nazi Germany, and they, they, they had a different, a more encompassing vision. So in my own work, I've, I've always seen myself as trying to uh, combine those two things. So a, lo a lot of French thought I find very empty because it has no empirical reference point, but you don't just want evidence, you want 
a, a, a moral, grand theory a moral vision, yes. So I was very lucky because I, I, I was taught by people who had both, and I, I kind of thought, well, they're both important, but the best thing is to try to put them in one place. So I, I, that was how I would define my work. That's what I've tried to do. So it's very empirical, it's very detailed, but I, I hope it has a kind of a, uh, uh, an overarching uh, vision. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And I imagine that you read um, uh, broadly. I, right? I, I always have done. Um, uh, literature, history, uh, yes, social science. Course. What is it you, uh, what's the, your, the, your favorite book that you've read recently in the last year? Well, that, that's, uh, yeah. Well, I, I guess, uh, I mean, in, 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 in my field, I, I, the, I think the, the, the best book of the last 10 years was, was Thomas Piketty's book. Piketty. I mean, mm -hmm. that, you know, there's a lot of problems with it, but it's a fundamental intervention. And again, what's good about it is, that, is the detail of the research that he's done. I mean, they spent a decade digging up all of those figures to trace in great detail the change in inequality. They didn't just say things are getting worse and this is bad. They said, look, this is how it's happened. That's what I admire. I admire that. I mean, and, and, and Piketty has a very strong moral position, but he also is a great researcher. And it's, it's that combination which I admire. Um, you, you teach graduate students. Um, or undergraduate students. I, I only university. teach postgraduates. Postgraduates, uh, yeah. Postgraduate of your yeah. PhD students, uh, or I or? mean, the, the, the uh, London has two campuses. It has one in the Midlands, which is comprehensive, and then the one in London is is a postgraduate institution. Uh, and your graduate students, where are you directing their research? If I was a graduate student who came and knocked on your door, what, what are the sort of the the, the key cutting edge areas? for research which are being... Well, um, they're very uh, various be because private, uh, yeah. almost all of my students are from outside the UK. So they bring with them different histories from, from Africa, from Latin America, from, uh -huh. from uh, Do you have Asia. any Mexican students? So, so their, 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 their questions are, are very much shaped by their personal experiences and the experiences of the society that they come from. So that, that for me, that's very exciting because they're not always the questions that an English person would ask. Yeah? Exactly. Um, so for me, it's a challenge uh, to, to find a way to help them to uh, ask the question more clearly and to, to, to decide what kind of evidence do we need to, to, to get a grip on this. So I, I, I feel I should give away my, half of my salary because I, <laughs> I, I learn far more from my students than I think they ever learned from me. I, I'm sure it's mutual. I'm sure it's mutual. I've learned a lot from you just in this um, so, you know, 50 I mean, minutes. But for me, having, having international students is wonderful. Uh -huh. uh, you know, so it's, most it's, of your students are international? Almost yeah. all of them, because oh, yeah? the, mm -hmm. the, the, the subsidy system for postgraduate research in, in England is more or less destroyed. Really? Uh, there are hardly any grants to be a postgraduate student. Uh, it's, it's a tragedy because so you have to come from a wealthy family, and if uh, you're yeah, from so a wealthy family, you're not going to go yeah, and study or, or, media uh, studies. You're going to uh, work in the. Well, you <laughs> might. Itself, you right? might, but um, no, that, that that that's right. So, I mean, again, you know, it's part of this sort of liberalisation of the university. Mm -hmm. We 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 we're, we've we've cut off we've cut off our own own feet. We're we're not reproducing the next generation in the in the in, in the quantities we need. We, because it's almost impossible to survive in the system now. You're, you're going to graduate as a, it costs nine and a half thousand pounds per year. Of tuition? To be, tuition fees, to, to be, even to take a degree in humanities. Um, so by the time, that's not, that's not counting living costs. So by the time you graduate, you've got about 60,000 pounds worth of debt. You're 21 years old. As you've an undergraduate, got, right? You've uh -huh. got this enormous debt, you know. Uh, it's, it's, it's not the ideal condition. Well, here in the UNAM, uh, we have a real um, privileged position. Yeah, the UNAM absolutely. UNAM is still one of the, you know, one of a great university. It's also one of yeah. the few really public and free universities in the world. No, 350,000 yeah, no, students who don't pay anything. No, um, I, I, I'm, you know, what, the, the, you think that's a, that's a positive you know, it, it, you know, it's a fundamental argument in economics. The old argument was, that a, a university educated person was valuable in two ways. It was obviously valuable to the person, they were much more likely to get an interesting and good job, but it was valuable for the society to have a, an educated population who were able to talk rationally without shouting, were able to, <laughs> you know, uh, be on the cutting edge of, of, of all, everything. 
what, what the assumption now, certainly in England, is the only value is to the individual. There's no social value in universities. Um, it's a disaster. It's a disaster. And that's the legitimation for making you pay for your education because you are the one who benefits. We need to go back, I mean, you know, you, we need to go back to exactly the position you've described because that is what will make the difference. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and the thing is, you could never know where talent lies, you know. It, it's in surprising places. And if, if it's regulated by money, you've, right. just, you've wasted so much you've talent. filtered out uh, yeah. an incredible amount of people. So you think that the, the UNAM and, and is, is actually a, a, a global example, not only in terms of the quality no, of education, it's a, it's a, but in terms of, this, of, of free access to education. No, it's, it's a beacon. Uh, you, 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 should be, you should be very, very <laughs> proud. Definitely, yeah. definitely. We are very proud. It's a real privilege to have you here, Graham. We're, we're running out of time. We've had a, a very nice, long conversation. We have five minutes left. Um, uh, tell me a little bit about your vision of, of Latin America and of Mexico in general. Have you traveled? This is not your first time in Mexico. How, long, how many times have you been in Mexico? Oh, I, I've been to Mexico about six times. Six times. Um, and I've been to Brazil. Brazil. Um, and I've been to Colombia. So I really don't know Latin America. And, I, I would be very hesitant because it's so different. I mean, you know, it's not, I, I, I don't like these portmanteau kind of descriptions, you know, like Africa, right, Latin America. Course. It doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, the histories are different and the, the trajectories are different. So I, I, I feel very disabled in making any kind of statement. Uh, I don't speak either Portuguese or, or, or Spanish. So again, I, 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 I really don't think you can talk about a society in this, you know the language because you can't be inside the society. You're always going to be outside if you don't have the language. But at least from what you're saying in terms of your students and your uh, visits is that there is um, some sort of hope from the global south, if you want to use that concept. Right? Sure. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, in, uh, with this sort of uh, collapse of the centralized world, although we still have lots of power in New York and, Wa and, and Washington. And, uh, well, and Wall unfortunately, we still do. <laughs> there's, there's, right, but, there, but this sort of increasingly multi-plural oh, yeah. world is, is actually creating a context for innovation, right? I, I, think, I think it's a very exciting time, but it's also a very turbulent time. And uh, uh, I think a very dangerous time, uh, because uh, uh, it's a very unstable. I mean, you, we, we have these incredible inequalities. You know, you have 62 people in the world who own as much as the rest of the world put together. I mean, that's, that's not a sustainable situation. We, we've, we've, I mean, part of what global, liberal, neoliberal globalization has done is, is to pull things apart. So in, in, all, in these societies, you've got a rising middle class, very affluent, but you've also got, you know, mass misery underneath. Um, and anger, and that, that's where in, 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 in Europe you see these, the rise of fascism, the rise of these right-wing movements, which we thought we would never see again, you know. And it's, it's driven by a sense of dispossession, a sense that they're left out, that, that somebody else is at the party and they're not being invited. And that's a very dangerous thing to let people believe about themselves. They don't believe that they're going to do better in life. The, the, the recent statistics show that most families believe that their children will be worse off than they were. That's a disaster. That's a real disaster. Uh, and it's a recipe for great political turbulence, I think. And from the media, we have the same kind of process going on as you, as you yeah. document in your own research, that we have this centralization, this manipulation, but there's also hope in the end from um, new technologies, yeah. from new communication well, strategies of defeating this well, elitist ideology. Or, yeah. well, or to go or back not. to where we started, it's one of the reasons why I've always argued so strongly for public and democratically controlled media. Not commercial, not, not, not allowing that one voice to dominate, but to create a space where we can begin to sit down together and puzzle out how we move forward. At the moment, we don't have a media that allows us to do that. So creating that space is, for me, the big challenge in media, for media specialists. Well, thank you so much, Graham, um, for sitting down here with us and, well, and, it's, and it's talking my, my, in this my public pleasure. space. My pleasure. Um, it's a real privilege to have you here at the UNAM. Hopefully, you come back. I, I hope so. I, well, I, I would love to come back. <laughs> well, thank, <laughs> thank you, you very so much. much. Thank you.